Hello, video 13. Um, here we look at the interrelationship between markets, something that we've already touched upon when we talked about substitute goods and complement goods. But now we specifically look at four concepts which explain the connections between micro markets and something we explore. So um, in this video, we're going to look at four types of interrelationships between markets. We're going to look at joint demand, which are complement goods, competitive demand, substitute goods, derived demand, and joint supply. So let's take the first one, joint demand. Joint demand, well, goods that are likely to be bought together and have a negative XED, cross elasticity of demand, are said to be in joint demand. An example is here, golf clubs and golf balls. Okay, so what can we expect to see uh, if these goods are in joint demand. Well, let's imagine that, that something um, uh, raises the price of golf clubs, a rise in the cost of production. Maybe some sort of rise in the cost of production drive uh, the supply inwards and raise the price of golf clubs. That's likely to have, and it reduces the quantity of golf clubs bought, it's likely to have uh, an effect in the market for golf balls, and it's likely to do this. It's likely to reduce the demand for golf balls, which in itself lowers the price and lowers the quantity supplied. So the impact of higher costs of production in the golf club market led to a fall in demand in the golf ball market, because fewer people were buying golf clubs, and so fewer people wanted to buy golf balls, because these are in joint demand, they were uh, good, they are good, that um, are complements to each other. Okay, right, that's a pretty straightforward one. Let's go on to the next one. Competitive demand. Goods that are unlikely to be bought together. They have a positive cross elasticity of demand between them. Okay, these goods. They are substitutes. Perhaps Coca Cola and Pepsi Cola are, is a good example of this. So, something happens in the Coca-Cola market. Now I can, I can interpret this as a change in the cost of production and shift the supply curve, or I could shift the demand curve as well. Um, let's shift the supply curve. Let's say that uh, something encourages Coca-Cola um, to produce because there's been a fall in their cost of production. I can, I can do it like that. And that's going to lower their price, and that's going to reduce the demand for the other good. Uh, the substitute good and lower the price. Okay, we can look at it like that. The, 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 the lower cost of production for Coca-Cola drove the price down. More people wanted to buy it. There was an increased quantity demanded of Coca-Cola, which led to a fall in the demand for Pepsi-Cola. Some drinkers of Pepsi-Cola switched to buying this product, Coca-Cola. But, you know, I really could also explore this with a change in demand. So let me just clean up the diagram and uh, look at that, look at the change in demand. If Coca-Cola produced a successful, um, one of their successful marketing campaigns where, um, you know, maybe it's near Christmas and they are able to uh, link their product with Father Christmas and happiness and family, families being all happy at Christmas and children smiling and the demand for Coca-Cola rises. That raises the quantity, it raises the price, and it will lead to a fall in the demand for the substitute good. Again, the price falls and the quantity falls. So, clearly the market for Pepsi is affected by things happening in the Coca-Cola market. Because they are in competitive demand, they are substitutes. Okay, let's move on now to a slightly more uh, difficult uh, concept. Derived demand. Well, derived demand uh, is a concept which is, I find, my students, gets jumbled up with uh, compliments. You have to be very careful here. Derived demand, when one good is demanded for use in the production of another good. It is said to be in derived demand. Cars and steel, two markets. Now, I don't know about you, but generally I don't go out and buy big pieces of steel. No, but I might go out and buy a car. But the people who buy steel are the producers of cars 
and other producers, maybe the construction industry. But let's imagine that the only purchaser of steel, sheets of steel, is the car industry. Well, if there is some change in the car industry, it's going to affect the steel industry because the demand for steel is derived from the demand for cars. No one demands steel for the sake of steel. The only demanders of steel, in my example, is the car industry. So let's imagine that uh, super awareness of the environment and concern for the environment leads to a fall in the demand for cars. If there is a fall in the demand for cars, there'll be a fall in the price of cars and there'll be a fall in the quantity supply because the lower price discourages car producers from making cars. But if fewer cars are being bought, then less steel needs to be bought. So there'll also be a fall in the demand for steel because the car producers don't need to buy as much steel and that lowers the price of steel and lowers the quantity of steel being bought. So the, the demand for steel was derived from the demand for cars. When something affects the amount of cars being bought, it affects the amount of steel being bought. Now the way that you can see that this is different from complements is, in a complement market, when it's joint demand, the two goods are bought by the same person, the golf clubs and the golf balls. However here, the supplier in this market is the demander in this market. Supplier of cars is the purchaser of steel, and that makes it different. Okay, finally, let's move on. Joint supply. Again, one that is much misunderstood. Joint supply, when the supply of one good must lead to the supply of another good. It's not easy to find examples of joint supply. Maybe there are certain chemical processes where in the production of one chemical, a byproduct is made, which is always made, and that's another chemical, maybe. But the textbook example, the one I've seen in every textbook in economics, and it's the one I'm going to use as well, is beef and leather. When a cow is slaughtered for its meat, its hide or its skin can also be, uh, is, is at that moment available as leather. Only when the cow is killed is it available as both beef and leather. So, this is an example of joint supply. Now, if um, something happens in one of the, I can start either way, if there's an increase in the demand for leather, it will affect beef. Or if there's a change in the market for beef, it will affect leather. Let's cast our minds back to when there was a crisis about uh, beef. The demand for beef fell enormously when mad cow's disease uh, was, was, was on the rampage, um, and, and, and uh, feeding the fears of, 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 of millions of Europeans. So, when that happened, there was a terrible fall in the demand for beef. And that led to a drop in the price of beef and beef farmers reducing the quantity of beef that they would supply. But that would also lead, therefore, to a fall in the supply of leather. There's a fall in the supply of leather. Now, because there's less leather available, only quantity two is now produced, it raises the price of leather. The fall in the demand for beef led to fewer cows being slaughtered, which led to less leather being available, which drove up the price of leather. Okay, joint supply. Somebody said to me once, oh, isn't lamb and wool another example of joint supply? But of course it isn't, because the wool of a sheep can be taken uh, without killing the sheep. But once you killed the sheep or the lamb for its meat, you may get a bit of wool, but that's the end of it. You're not going to get any more wool from that, from that animal. So it's not a good example. There really aren't that many examples for joint supply. Um, but it is an important concept because it shows the interrelationship between two markets. Okay, hope that was a useful video for you. Um, you know, you can always uh, get in touch with me. I think I'll put the email address at the end of this video. Um, you're well into the course now. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, drop me a line. Let me know uh, how I can uh, help you or improve these videos. And, um, and uh, there we are. Yeah. So, there we are. Bye-bye.